there were a lot of assignments where you're going to, um, you know, to cover a homicide or, or a shooting and you sort of have to really learn how to approach people that are in pain and approach people that are, you know, their lives have just been shaken. I would say Jake really taught me a lot about how to appropriately be in a place as a journalist when you're probably the last person that people want to see. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Photo Forward podcast, where we explore the stories behind some of the greatest visual storytellers in the world. From their photographic origins to finding work-life balance as creative professionals, to how to actually make a living as a photographer, videographer, or multimedia creator. We're gonna uncover what makes them tick and their shutters click. I'm your host, Ben Brewer. Everybody listening to this podcast probably knows either from practical experience or just intuitively, that crafting a career as a photographer or other visual creator is no small feat. From staving off burnout to managing finances, freelancers have to do it all. So why is it then that freelancers so often fail to actually break out of that vicious cycle of feast or famine workloads? Well, our guest today is the perfect example of how to make it happen. As a freelance photojournalist, diving in headfirst to new locations and experiences and figuring it all out along the way. Lauren Justice is a freelance photojournalist currently based in Madison, Wisconsin. Trust, intimacy, and time are cornerstones of her work and believes in using photography as a tool for education, awareness, and understanding. Clients of hers include the New York Times, the Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, the Atlantic, and NPR, just to name but a few. Lauren has attended the Eddie Adams Workshop and the New York Times Portfolio Review, where we start today's conversation. So if you've been pining after getting that invitation letter, we talk about everything you'll want to know going into it. Lauren and I talk through her strategy as a two-time NYT portfolio review invitee and how in-person meetings with editors have led to far more work than cold emails or pitches. We then get into her career as an independent photojournalist and the path that took her across the country from Ohio to Flint, Michigan, Nebraska, and finally to Madison, Wisconsin, and the visual stories she crafted along the way. And finally, we go in deep on her recent incredible portrait series featured on the NYT Lens blog, What Would I Have Done If I Would Have Killed Her That Night, and her process for long-term storytelling. Show notes and links to photos featured in today's episode can be found at photoforward.media forward slash podcast. So, without any further ado, my interview with photojournalist Lauren Justice. Lauren Justice, welcome to the Photo Forward podcast. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for having me. All right. So I wanted to touch on something that probably just happened recently for you. Uh, that's an experience I think a lot of photographers are uh, a bit envious of. Uh, so I want to touch a little bit on the New York Times portfolio review. Yeah, yeah, that was a great experience. Um, I went, what was that? I think it was about two weeks ago now. And... It was my second time at the portfolio review. So the first time I went was in 2014. Um, and I took very different approaches between both times I went. The first time um, I met with a lot of really great long-term document documentary photographers um, or a lot of phot photographers that focus on long-term work and um, didn't really meet with any editors. And so then this most recent time, I just focused primarily on meeting with editors and um, trying to think about getting future work from, from new places. Yeah, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that 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 is two different ways to to go about it. I guess the the editor side and the and the photographer side. Um, tell me a little bit about like what that experience is like when you're there. Tell, kind of paint a picture for uh, for the audience. Yeah. Um, so the day that I went um, this time around was on Saturday. They kind of break the review up between Saturday and Sunday. Saturday is any photographer aged 18 and older, and then Sunday is for photographers aged 18 to 27. And so this time around, I was there on Saturday. So you get there at about 9 a.m., and they have people handing out, um, you know, your 
schedule for the day and there's a little bit of an introduction and then you have 20 minutes with each person. So you are set up, there were seven editors that you were set up with this year. Um, they put in an extra person for each photographer Mm -hmm. and then, um, There were also some occasions where if some editors had, you know, a gap in their schedule, then you could kind of hop in and and meet with them. And then afterwards, at the end of the day, you were able to meet with people, too. So I ended up meeting with 10 editors in total that day. And, um, you know, and then there are also a lot of great photographers there that you could meet and talk with as well. It was sort of a nice reunion in some cases. I saw some photographers there that I haven't seen in a while. That was really nice to catch up and see how they're doing. Yeah, that's great. So, so what would you think, what's the, what was your big takeaway from some of those conversations? What were some of the the lessons you, you kind of gained from some of those editors or just kind of things that uh, caught you by surprise, I guess? Yeah. Um, I think one of the best parts about it was just the, having conversations about the work and thinking about new ways to tell stories, sort of feeding Mm -hmm. off of um, project work that I've already done and talking with editors about, you know, other ways to do it or, um, you know, potential future assignments or um, long-term work that could come out of it. And I think that was, for me, one of the best parts is just sort of diving into conversations about, um, how to cover different topics and, and what that means and, um, and where that can go. Hmm. That's really interesting. Yeah. It is kind of that blend of, of both sort of pitching and also having them critique, uh, what you already have, uh, set Mm -hmm. in front of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Well, that's awesome. Um, so we're going to get into some of your more recent work as well, because there's some that I know some people have seen and it is some fantastic stuff. Uh, but let's go back a little ways. Um, what was that moment like? Or tell me a little bit about when you kind of knew you wanted to be a photographer. <laughs> um, I think I was like 13 years old. You know, I definitely didn't know the term photojournalism, but I definitely knew that um, that I liked using images to tell stories and to educate. Um, I probably wouldn't have said it in that way at age 13, but that's, um, that's sort of where I saw photography as being a really big draw for me. Hmm. Um, and I didn't start really doing anything in photography until later when I had one darkroom class in high school, but I didn't start in photojournalism until I was a junior in college. So the difference between the time that I knew I was interested in it and when I actually started working towards something in that field was, was a pretty long time. Yeah. And it's, it is kind of a process to kind of decide, well, you kind of work towards the area of photography, this as well as style along the way. So, I mean, I don't think anybody starts out as a photographer knowing, you know, absolutely. I want to be a photojournalist. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So you got, you kind of had that, that bug planted kind of when you're earlier 13. Um, tell me a little about how that came up, came about in college that you kind of moved towards more of the photojournalism side. Um, yeah, I, in college I, I bounced around a little bit. I started at Ohio university. Um, I was in the visual communications program, but I was under a different, um, program. I wasn't, I wasn't in the photojournalism track. Um, and I, I met some photojournalists there that were studying and was always really, you know, interested in what they were working on and um, and what they were up to. And then transferred out of that school and kind of took some time off of school, mm-hmm. went back to the University of Cincinnati. Um, and I was trying to decide between graphic design and photojournalism and mm-hmm. um, ultimately decided on photojournalism. I mean, I, I always... I think that was always going to be my choice. It was just a matter of, you know, actually deciding to, to go after that. Huh. That's interesting. What about, uh, what about graphic design kind of drew you into that? Cause I kind of see those as, you know, generally in the visual field, but it in pulling in very different directions. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think I was really, I don't know. I just, I think I liked the idea of, um, 
I don't know. I don't know. To be honest, I don't know if I have a great answer for that question. <laughs> I think that I was just kind of, uh, it was something that I found interesting and, um, and creative and that, that I thought that I would have, you know, a lot of fun working on. I mean, growing up, I think I was interested in designing things and making things and, um, um, and graphic design sort of fit within that similar field. Hmm. Well, you know, no explanation required. You're talking to the guy who's a photojournalist with a biochem degree just because that's what he enjoyed. <laughs> so I totally understand. <laughs> <laughs> So later in college, you kind of knew which path uh, you were you were planning to go down. Um, the photojournalism industry has been in a tough place for a while. Like, and that's just a statement of fact. Um, what were those kind of early early years like for you coming out of college? Uh, what was your approach? So coming out of college, uh, you know, a lot of my peers were applying for jobs. They were applying for full-time staff positions. I wasn't really ready for that. And I didn't exactly know what I wanted out of photojournalism or what path I wanted to take. So I took some time figuring that out. Um, I worked at a bar for like a year and I assisted a photographer in Cincinnati for a while. I did some traveling, um, and I also, after about like 10 months, I went to the Eddie Adams workshop. And hmm. I think that kickstarted me back into the mindset of, okay, I need to actually figure out what I'm doing here and get a direction, you know, get on a path that's actually working towards this career. And, um, and so that sort of kickstarted me back into the the thought process of, of what can I do next. And then I started on a round of inner, um, of internships. I did an internship at the Fayetteville Observer in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Um, then from there, I went to an internship at the Flint Journal in Flint, Michigan. From there, I moved to Nebraska with a group of people and um, worked on long-term documentary project with a group of people. And, um, and that lasted three months for the project. And then I stuck around Nebraska working for the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. And we went back to work on that same project again for an additional month. Hmm. Um, and then I moved to Wisconsin and started freelancing in late 2014. Okay. So that, that's gotten us to Wisconsin. Um, so tell me a little bit about, uh, your time in Flint because that's, that's just such a fascinating place. And, and the work that is coming out of there consistently is just incredible. So tell me a little bit about your time as an intern there. I started there in late 2012. Um, and I was there for eight months. Flint's a really interesting community to be documenting. Flint was a really beautiful place and it was also a very challenging place. I would say that it definitely tested my, you know, you, you're definitely put into a lot of breaking news situations. You cover a lot of violence. You see a lot of things that you don't necessarily cover all the time at other newspapers um, just because of, you know, the the crime rates, the shooting rates. There were a lot of assignments where you're going to um, you know, to cover a homicide or, or a mm. shooting and you sort of have to really learn how to approach people that are in pain mm. and approach people that are, you know, their lives have just been shaken. And so, you know, Jake May was my boss for a part of the time. Um, he came in after when I started there, I had a different boss, but, um, Jake came in and I would say Jake really taught me a lot about how to, how to appropriately be in a place as a journalist when you're probably the last person that people want to see. Hmm. There's also just a lot of, you know, there's a lot of really beautiful parts of Flint too. Um, that's very much worth talking about as well. But I, I think one of the things that kind of stuck with me and taught, taught me the most was just going to so many of those, you know, sort of more tragic events. Yeah, that's, uh, that's really interesting. And that's, it's really kind of speaks to, to what it means to be a journalist that, that can have empathy for, for the people in the stories, because it's, those are, 
some of the most challenging moments that, that we face is, is how do you approach this situation with, you know, with care, with, with the right level of, of empathy for the people there while still honestly doing your job. I think, I think, uh, it's us and maybe doctors that, that have to deal with that kind of seeing people on their worst days. Um, what were kind of some of the things that, that Jake kind of worked with you on and taught you and as throughout that process, because I think that's really critical. I see a lot of photographers just kind of ambling their way through some of these really tough moments and just not taking the right level of care with the situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I would say that, that, before and even after um, working with Jake and talking to Jake about some of these situations that I've been a little bit more pulled back and wanting to respect people more so from a distance. Um, And I think that that can also sometimes create skepticism. Hmm. Um, But I I would say what what Jake really did really well was, um, I mean, he would you know, he would, I mean, he was a human first and he would give people hugs and he would, you know, tell them Mm -hmm. who he was and, and tell them how sorry he was. And, you know, he, he was a human first. And, um, so I think that helped me feel less, um, I don't know, I guess a little, I guess like he sort of helped show me how to be a human in some of those moments that you, you know, you're walking into this life changing moment for someone that's happened very suddenly and, um, and approaching it like a human first is, is incredibly important. And, um, and I think that he really helped me learn how to, how to stop being so afraid of, of approaching people in those moments and, um, and to just allow allow that to happen naturally. Hmm. Hmm. I think a lot of photographers, uh, there, there's a whole spectrum of photographers. Some use the, use the camera as a means to, to like bring people into their world. And some people use the camera to kind of put up the wall and say, well, I'm on this side of it. I'm doing my job. So that's kind of interesting to kind of break that, break that barrier. And, and, you know, like you said, be a human in some of those tough times. What's a most like a notable, like difficult story that you've worked on that, that kind of, I guess, maybe tested you kind of pushed you in, in, in whatever way you kind of want to take that. I think talking through some of these difficult situations and, and figuring out how to approach them, like what are, what was a, a notable assignment or a project that you worked on, whether it's at Flint or not, um, that really tested you? I've done a lot of work over the years on domestic violence with victims and with perpetrators. And I would say kind of learning how to talk to people in those situations has been a a learning curve over the years. Um, And most of, I'd say most of what I've done hasn't actually been published, but they've all been sort of learning moments and, um, and helping towards the next, um, the next one. But it's definitely something that, you have to be, you know, very aware and careful of what you're saying and how you're saying it and, and how you're approaching people. Hmm. Hmm. I do want to get into uh, a little bit, um, the project that kind of, I kind of alluded to, uh, earlier, uh, the, what would I have done if I would have killed her that night, which, uh, which recently came out and is just, these are some really incredible portraits. We'll feature this in the, the show notes for the episode, but I want to get in that a little bit later. So you've mentioned working on some of these longer term projects, some documentary kind of pieces. Um, do you have a particular process that you kind of go through, uh, whether it's, I mean, finding stories or, uh, working through them? Um, or is it a little different every time? Um, I'd say it changes depending on what the work is and, um, and how much I know about it beforehand. Um, cause it, I mean, research is definitely important. So if it's a, it's a top, if it's a topic that I don't know that much about what I'm interested in, like I, I like to try and understand as much as I can before going in. Um, and I worked on, a project in Nebraska with a group of people. And that was sort of a unique situation because it was, it was very collaborative and, um, and they came to me with the idea. And so it was sort of, you know, all of us talking together about what we were hoping to get out of the work and what, you know, 
visions we had for the project. And um, so that was a very different experience than pursuing, you know, something longer term on an individual level. Mm-hmm. Tell me a little bit about that uh, that project that you did in Nebraska. What was what was kind of the the genesis of it? What was it What was it about? How did you go about it? Uh, let's let's dive into that a bit. Yeah. Um, so that was a project looking at Valentine, Nebraska. Um, we called it "Fly Over Me, Valentine," and I worked on that um, with Andrew Dickinson, Jacob Slomke, and Nick Teets, and they reached out to me to see if I would be interested in, in collaborating with them. I had met Andrew at the Eddie Adams workshop. And so that was sort of our, um, our connection. And we had talked before about wanting to collaborate within a group of people on a longer term project and do something that was a little more immersive. Um, so they reached out to me with the idea of this project and, um, we, did a Kickstarter fund and, hmm. and raised some money to get out there and spend a summer in Valentine. And, um, we rented a house. We, you know, lived there, we shopped there, we hmm. went out at night there, um, got to know the community on a little bit of a deeper level than, than most of the assignment work that, um, you know, you typically receive mm-hmm. as a freelancer. Um, and then, we extended it into the following summer. We worked there for a month again, um, with eight people that time. So more people went out with us and we again rented a house and and lived in the community and, um, and just kind of continued telling stories about the, about the town. What about the town, uh, drew you into it that, that made this, uh, made this the subject of the story? Um, we were looking for somewhere in Nebraska. That's where the the three guys were based. And um, they had some connections in Valentine. It also had you know, some, in terms of the smaller communities, it had a few things that made it unique. Um, they have a pretty big tourism industry in Valentine. Um, they're also on the South Dakota border and bordering the Rosebud Indian Reservation um, and they have a ranching community as well. And so we were sort of looking at all of those aspects of, of the town and how they worked together and, um, and just thought that that would be, you know, a good place to, to spend Mm -hmm. a decent amount of time in. Yeah. And, and having that amount of time to, to really become part of the community, that's, that's got to just lead to just a whole different level of connection with the people in the photos. It did. And, and I think that it, it earned us a lot of respect too, especially going back the second summer, you know, we heard from a lot of people that they couldn't believe that we came back. Um, and so I think that says a lot for, you know, storytelling and going into communities that aren't your own is just, you know, you know, making sure that there's time and space for the people that live there and, and that, you know, it matters what you do while you're there and, and how long you're there and, and how people are treated. And, um, so I think that it gave us, like you said, a much better connection with people and, um, and deeper relationships. Hmm. And funding it through Kickstarter. That's, that strikes me as interesting. That, that doesn't seem like the standard approach. You know, a lot of times you'd hear about, uh, you know, going down the grant funding path, uh, for something like this. What, what was the decision process to, to go down that for, for, to kickstart it instead of uh, a grant funding. Um, I think that we'd, we'd seen some other projects doing the same thing and around that same time. And, um, I, I don't think I'm the best person to answer that question. Mm-hmm. I think, um, Andrew was a great, you know, leader in the Kickstarter process, um, and Jacob as well. And it, it was also self-funded. So we, you mm-hmm. know, we all kicked in our own money that the Kickstarter definitely did not pay for, um, for the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but it did give us the opportunity to kind of show people what we were hoping to do. We did a preliminary visit to Valentine in March before moving out there and we captured still photos as well as video footage of the landscape. And we did some interviews with some community members and business owners and, um, we able to, to kind of piece together what we, you know, felt the sense of the place was at least from that initial visit and, um, and get some, 
some quotes from from people that lived there to help describe what the community was like and you know what what they cared about and I think that that also helped the community understand a little bit about what we were hoping to to do that summer and to you know build a little bit of trust as well because we could you know show them this is this is kind of what we're looking at and um and we did that a lot once we were in town too. One of the the first things we did was sort of a um, not not necessarily man on the street interviews, but sort of a collection of interviews with people across the community. Um, we would ask the same ten or so questions and just get an understanding of who people were, and that helped us meet people. That helped us um, introduce ourselves to to you know, a number of people across town and also find potential leads for stories and Mm -hmm. um, just get to know the area better. That's a, that's a great approach is to just kind of make yourself part of the community instead of trying to just, you know, as we often are forced to do, uh, is just kind of swoop in and try to pull together a story in a short amount of time, not knowing any of the people or the community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I, I think is really interesting about your work, um, is is your sort of approach in your portraiture it's very it's kind of unassuming um and i think for a lot of photographers especially younger ones uh the idea of posing people for portraits and and coming up with something that that captures who they are as a person um is really challenging and and for the more introverted uh, um, among us in the crowd um, it's a real it can be a real struggle so in some of your work tell me a little bit how you're engaging with people as you're as you're creating some of these portraits that that do feel very very intimate yeah um, I would say that I definitely identify with the introverts in the crowd Um, (laughs) portraiture for me in the beginning was definitely a struggle. Um, I was way more comfortable with sort of the candid approach. And, and I think that that still feeds into my portrait work now, but, um, but I'm definitely a lot more comfortable with it. I try not to pose too much. I don't give a ton of direction. I try to make conversation with people before they, you know, before we're, we're taking the images. I try to talk to people about, you know, maybe about the article that's being written or the issue that's being focused on, um, but also just about like who they are. I ask about their kids and I ask about their life. Um, just try to have conversations that that feel normal, um, and I think that that sometimes can ease any amount of um, you know uncertainty or tension that people feel about being photographed. But I often just use window light and hmm. um, pretty minimal direction, to be honest, and, and just conversation. I would say those are some of the main things that are consistent. Hmm. Yeah. And it it does feel very that sort of intimate look that just makes you feel like you're right there. It doesn't it doesn't feel necessarily like a produced photo. It looks like you're just sitting on the couch across from somebody, basically. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that sort of conversational approach is definitely, um, you know, something that I've, I've done a lot. I think that I could benefit from mixing it up sometimes and, and trying new things and, you know, getting out of my comfort zone. But, um, but I, I like getting to know people. I, I like when I'm challenged. Um, I think that, you know, hearing, other people's points of view and, and giving them that space is, is really important. Mm-hmm. So speaking of challenges, uh, part of the show, I want it to be kind of the unvarnished truth in some ways about what the photo industry is and isn't. Um, what would you say is kind of your biggest struggle as, as working as a freelancer right now? Um, because I also in the same boat, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough road. And, and I want to kind of paint a real honest picture of what, what life is like, uh, for the photojournalist freelancer. Yeah. Um, I mean, making a living, like, I think that that's definitely the, the biggest challenge and figuring out how to, how to make this work and, and have it be sustainable. Mm. Um, I've always balanced part-time jobs with freelance work and I've been lucky to, to work at places that are very flexible and, um, and that, 
you know, I'm able to find either help with coverage or move things around in order to do assignment work. And I, I've always put assignments first. That's always been a main priority. So, um, it doesn't make me the best coworker at my other jobs. And so I think that finding a balance is, um, has been something that I've, I've been working on for a long time. And, and I would, you know, ideally love to get out of that cycle of needing mm-hmm. a part-time job. And it's just a matter of, um, of getting there and doing that. I think that I don't think that I, you know, pursued pitching or meeting editors enough when I was first starting. Mm-hmm. And, um, but I think it's okay. I think that it, that allowed me to do some other things that I was interested in, other other work that I was interested in outside of journalism, and um, and you know, so I don't regret that time. But I I do kind of wish that I'd started a little bit sooner. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, that's that's definitely a a real concern. You know, I I know for me, I kind of got a late start as well, and and it really does seem like that it's exactly where I was going to go next was kind of building those connections with, with editors is beyond huge. So I'd like to go into that a little bit more of, of how, what's been your approach of, of building those connections with, with editors, with newspapers, with say art director kind of, kind of folks, uh, and how that's allowed you to, to build up your, your body of work. When it comes to freelancing, my first contacts came from going to the New York Portfolio Review in 2014. I wasn't freelancing at the time, so my focus there wasn't necessarily to build that um, network of people to get assignments from or anything like that. But um, but I met a couple editors there and um, got my first assignment for the New York Times because of that. And um, and then from there, I was referred to other editors and sort of started building work in that way. Um, I also, in the beginning, did some cold emailing, which mm. which worked in some cases and didn't work in others. Um, I did a little bit of pitching in the beginning, and um, and that helped. But I would say what I should have been doing sooner and what I've started doing now is, is making trips to New York and actually meeting with editors face to face. Hmm. I didn't actually do that for the first time until October of this past year. And, um, and I saw a very immediate, you know, increase in work that came in from, you know, and some were from editors that I had already worked with a number of times, but some were from new editors and, um, and just even just, having that face to face time for me was incredibly valuable in terms of, you know, knowing where the editors that I am working with are working from and sort of getting a sense of, of, um, what it's like on their end too, because when you don't live in New York or when you don't live in one of these cities where everyone else is based, it's really hard to sort of get a sense of the day to day life that they're, um, you know, that they have and, and what goes into to hiring photographers and things like that. And so I think that was a really helpful, helpful thing for me to do. So I went in October and then I was there just a couple of weeks, ago, just a couple of weeks ago for the portfolio review again. And I think that's going to become a more regular part of my process of just, you know, going back to New York on, on a fairly regular basis and just seeing people face to face and, and building those relationships that way. Mm, that's a great approach uh, because I think, yeah, I think we we might also we forget a little bit about how they operate, and I think to some degree, you know, us being in the Midwest here and in, in lovely Madison, Wisconsin, as the snow falls in April, I think people <laughs> forget about us too. I think to some degree, the Midwest can be a little forgotten about. So that is something important to just kind of you know check in with people and you know as we've said before, be a real human. Yeah, definitely. All right. So we've touched on a lot of different topics here. Um, one that I really wanted to be able to spend some time on is is one that I've alluded to before, which is the project. What would I have done if I would have killed her that night, uh, which was recently featured in the New York Times photo blog. So I want to touch a little bit on this whole project because it really is just so impactful, the work um, and clearly the amount of time that you'd spent on it. So take me back to the beginning of when you started that project. What was the impetus? Kind of what what kicked that all off? 
Yeah. Um, so I was part of a mentorship program through Anderson Ranch with um, Ed Cashy and Jim Estrin. And I was one of 15 people in this mentorship group. And we were each um, in the program for three years and working on personal passion projects. And sort of the goal of the program was to work on something for this period of time and um, have something to show for it at the end, whether that's a book or an exhibit or um, something published in a magazine or newspaper. And I had pitched a number of stories about domestic violence. Um, it's an issue that I've focused on a lot in the past and I was working at a domestic violence shelter at the same time. And, um, so I really wanted to tell stories about the issue and was figuring out different ways of how to do that. Um, I had sort of started working with victims and I was following a couple of women through their experience at a living in a domestic violence shelter, um, a couple hours outside of Madison. And I was following them for a little while. And then I sort of, I sort of realized that I wanted to focus more on the root of the issue. And I, you know, also working at a shelter, you, you see some of the same faces come back multiple times. And with domestic violence, you know, it's on average, it takes seven times of leaving before a woman leaves for good. And so when you're working at a shelter and, and seeing these same faces time and time again, you know, I just sort of kept wondering what's happening for the abuser, what's, what's happening for the other person in this relationship. And I, you know, regardless of whether this particular woman is um, re-entering that relationship when she leaves here or not, like there's still a future relationship for him. And, and what's, you know, what are the resources available? Is there anything and does it work? Um, and so I had read a book, um, Why Does He Do That? by Lundy Bancraft when I was younger. And so I knew that these programs for people who have abused their partners existed. And, um, and I decided to sort of start exploring that, um, that aspect of the issue and really just wanted to mainly understand the other perspective. Um, in the beginning I was interviewing victims and perpetrators, not from the same couple, but, um, um. but I was interviewing and photographing them both in, in similar ways as a way to, to show and talk about both perspectives. And, um, and then when it came time to kind of put together a piece for the times, um, and we'll just put together, you know, something to publish and talk about it. I kept it with just the, the perpetrators. Hmm. So what, what's, what was going through your head as, as you're kind of listening to these stories of, of the men who had perpetrated this? I mean, this is, this is kind of the quintessential example of, you know, a painful thing to hear, a painful, like a terrible moment um, in in these women's lives. Like what what's going through your head kind of throughout that process? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. I think there are a lot of things going through my head. By the time that I interviewed the people in this project, I had already gotten to know them over a period of time. I went to these classes on a regular basis and I tried to wait until I knew, you know, a little bit more of, of their personalities, a little bit more of their histories. Um, and that, that helped with, with the interviews. I mean, I would say that with some of them, there was some denial with some of them. And I would say, you know, during those points I would, you know, I would, sometimes I would, ask the same question multiple times or, um, you know, try to address the denial. I think mostly I just, I just let them talk and I wanted to, I wanted to hear what they had to say. I mean, I went into the interviews wanting to understand sort of their life perspective. And so outside of, outside of that, that terrible incident, um, you know, and it's hard to know how many incidents there were, mm -hmm. uh, outside of the one that that sent them to jail or outside of the one that sent them to this class but I wanted to know more about who they were as well um, outside of that incident um, and so I, you know for the most part I asked them questions about their lives growing up I asked them about other relationships about their perspectives I also wanted to know if they understood when 
these things were about to happen. And so, you know, Victor talked about what it felt like before he became abusive and, and he, you know, recognizes sort of the signs and symptoms for him. Hmm. And, um, so there's a lot that, there's a lot that didn't publish the interviews that I did with, with each person lasted on average between 45 minutes and an hour and a half, mm-hmm. you know, within that time frame, we, we kind of covered a lot of different, a lot of different topics and yeah. So getting back to, I, you kind of mentioned that like you started going to these meetings, like how, how was that? What was that like showing up to those and, and kind of trying to, build that, that trust and that, that access to, to this place that I think most of us would never even dream of being a part of, or, or ever, ever think to, to go to one of these places. Um, so Victor was my entry point. Um, I had gone to a monthly meeting that facilitators have and one of the facil and I pitched my project there. And one of the facilitators said she had this client who she thought would be appropriate and would be interested. And, and so that was Victor. Um, and he ended up transferring out of her class into this other one. So I had met him before I went in and, and I did, he's sort of the unique one out of the group and that I, I interviewed him before I went to the class and, um, and I had also interviewed a local facilitator as well, sort of about what these classes are like, what I should expect going in, um, and it was more of a research-based interview. So I, I had an idea of, you know, what it was going to be like. I did not know what to expect in terms of, you know, whether or not people would be open to sharing or open to me being there. And I I was really surprised at the number of people that were open to talking with me. Mm-hmm. And um, after the first meeting, I, you know, I, I left that first meeting with three people having signed releases mm-hmm. and... I wasn't expecting that at all. Um, so that was very, that was very surprising. And, um, and, you know, after I introduced myself to the class and talked about the project that I was working on and, and why I was doing it and, you know, sort of the direction that, that I imagined it going, um, Victor chimed in and talked about his experience with the interview and, and what it was like working with me and Mm. and why he was doing it. And, um, I don't know if that had an impact on other people being interested. Um, I never asked that, but I would be curious to know if that was something that, um, that influenced other people wanting to speak about it or not. Sure. Yeah. It's just a, it's all about building trust. I mean, just the same way you did when you're entering into those communities, you just have to to build the trust among the group that you're not out to, to paint them in the wrong light or, or try to make them look as anything other than what they are. So were the portraits, the, the last part of the project? I did the portraits and the interviews at the same time, Mm. um, in the same meeting for most of them. I, um, went to the homes of these guys and I would do the, the audio, they were audio interviews. So I would record the interviews first and then set up for the portraits. And, um, they weren't, they were sort of in the middle. I mean, I went to a number of classes and then I would do the interviews and portraits and I would continue going to the classes. And so the way that these work with the program is the men come in at different points in time. So you'll have, you know, maybe one person in the class has been there for four months and then someone else who's in their first or second week. And so, um, Hmm. I think Jake was, pretty close to the end of his time when I started going to the classes. So there wasn't quite as much time spent with him in the program. Um, but with others, you know, I, I went to a few classes, did the interview and portraits, and then continued seeing them at the classes for however long until, until they finished or until, um, until I, I stopped going. Mm -hmm. Was there some hesitation on their part, uh, for the, the photo portion? There wasn't, no. Hmm. They just, they just kind of felt comfortable with, with all that had gone through. And then this was just kind of just part of it. Right. Yeah, I, I guess so. Mm. Um, in the beginning, I, you know, I wasn't necessarily expecting people to want to talk about it or be photographed and there wasn't, there were definitely people in the class that did not want to, to participate. Mm -hmm. Um, so whenever I went to the classes, there were always people that I was not taking photos of and that I, um, 
you know, was being careful to not make uncomfortable or whatever, but they, um, the ones that did agree to do it said that they were fine with, with being photographed and with being interviewed. And a lot of them did it because they, they said that they wanted to help other men. And Jake is someone who has said since the, since the piece is published, he said that he wants to continue working with people and continue talking about, um, his experience and, and kind of, kind of help other people that are in a position that, that he found that he was in. Wow. Well, that it, it has all turned into an incredibly powerful series of photographs as well as, as the words uh, that from those interviews. So I would say kudos to you. This is an incredible project that people should absolutely take a look at if they haven't already. All right. Well, Lauren, this has been a fantastic conversation about, about your work as a freelancer and, and creating some really impactful work. So we're going to wrap up uh, the interview with just a few kind of lightning round style questions, kind of quick Quick questions, quick answers uh, to wrap things up. And then we can let people know uh, where they can find more of your work online. What's the one thing in your bag that you'd never leave home without? Uh, snacks. <laughs> <laughs> Very important. <laughs> what do you do outside of photography that recharges you? Just spending time with friends. I go on a lot of walks. Um, I just, I like being out in nature, um, getting outside. That works. What's the most important thing you've said no to? Most important thing I've said no to, I don't know. I feel like you get in this mindset of you can't say no. <laughs> um, I think in some cases I'm still learning to say no. That's a good answer. I think we all, I think in freelancers, we, uh, we do tend to just say yes to, to whatever comes our way because you never know. So I think that is, it is a learning process. What advice would you give to someone graduating from college today that's considering a career in news or photography? I would say follow your passion, follow what you're interested in. Um, you know, I think the best work comes from places that, you know, from people when you can tell that they're really invested in it and that they really care about it. I think that that really shows through in images. Um, and patience is really important and persistence. And finally, uh, where can people see more of your work, uh, or connect with you online? Um, you can find more work on my website at www.laurenjustice.com or you can follow me on Instagram. My Instagram handle is Lauren Justice Photo. Well, thanks so much for coming on the podcast, Lauren. Uh, I hope everyone learned a lot from this and uh, they should check out your work online. Great. Thanks so much, Ben. Thanks for listening to today's episode, everyone. You can find a full transcript of the show with show notes, links, photos, and more at photoforward.media forward slash podcast. Enjoying listening to the Photo Forward podcast? Want to hear more thought-provoking, engaging discussions about photography, business, and creativity? Well, this is where you come in. We want to get the word out as wide as possible about Photo Forward and reach as many listeners as possible. And the best way to do that is through reviews and recommendations on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you consume your podcasts. If you want to support more engaging and intimate conversations with photographers, videographers, and storytellers the world over, head on over to the Photo Forward page and drop a review or even a rating. It means a ton to growing the show, and I personally read through each and every review to make this show the best damn visual storytelling podcast out there. Thanks for listening, and see you all soon.